Welcome to the Who Knows This podcast, where I track down in the trenches experts to answer questions that we all want the answers to. I'm Sam Visnick, and I'm a veteran in working with people with chronic aches and pains by way of massage therapy, exercise, pain education, hypnotherapy, and lifestyle education. Today, we're going to talk about body composition, and in particular, setting the record straight on what actually works. So let's get started. Okay, welcome. Then I want to read a quick bio here so you know who I'm interviewing. Today, we've got Bill Campbell. And Dr. Campbell is a PhD, is a professor of exercise science and a director of the Performance and Physique Enhancement Laboratory at the University of South Florida. He's a certified strength and conditioning specialist from the National Strength and Conditioning Association and also the former president of the International Society of Sports Nutrition. Dr. Campbell has published over 200 scientific papers and abstracts, three textbooks, and 20 book chapters in the areas related to physique enhancement, sports nutrition, resistance training, and dietary supplementation. He's also an expert at body composition, which is why I've asked him to come on today. So I'm excited to have him. Let's get started. All right, Bill, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm excited to have this talk because, um, as usual, I have a ton of questions for you and, and my selfish need to have all of my questions answered. And of course, for the benefit of all my podcast listeners as well. <laughs> yes. So first question I have, um, which I'm interested in, is what got you into this kind of niche in, within your field of study? What, what got you interested in it specifically? When I was younger, I really was into bodybuilding for a few years. I, I did a bodybuilding show. So I, I would say it, it was the bodybuilding lifestyle. Um, particularly, I loved dietary supplements. Like I was just fascinated with this. Maybe this one can help me grow more muscle and this one help me lose more fat. So it was actually the science of supplements that kind of introduced me into just human physiology. So bodybuilding and supplements. And the, the funny thing is most of the supplements are garbage. They don't really do much, but it was what got me interested when I was younger. Yeah. And that field is still expanding. There's always new stuff coming out constantly. Right. So hard to keep up with all of that. But so then you kind of niche down in, in particular within the realm of, of body composition, but you have a particular uh, scope of type of people that you look at when you, when you do this. So uh, how did you lead into that direction and, and why specifically? Yeah. So I mentioned bodybuilders as kind of like what, what really got me into the, the field of fitness when I was younger. And now my, my, the research that I do, the, the audience that it serves is not necessarily bodybuilders. Now they can glean a lot of value from what I do, but I've, I've kind of scaled back and the, the audience that my research targets is a fitness enthusiast. So people who are into lifting weights, maybe they do some cardio, they really watch what they eat. And essentially they want to look like a bodybuilder, but not go through the competition aspect, not step on stage, not wear tiny, um, you know, tiny amount of clothes, not get all the tanning stuff. So it's, it's for people who want to live a pretty lean lifestyle and who are pretty serious about their exercise and nutrition programs. Now, how we look at those two different populations, so let's say the general population and that population, is the information going to be different or is it just a, the focus of the, of the type of individual that you use in, in studies and so forth? I am. Um, the information would be similar. Now, if I was dealing with somebody who hasn't started to exercise, I would say the information that I would choose to disclose to them would be peeled back or scaled back. Just like if somebody's a competitive bodybuilder, they've got to add a few more layers of commitment and discipline. So it's really about commitment in terms of time and, um, I, we may get to this, but just protein intake, really, that's really the one nutrient that distinguishes the, this, this general population to an elite level bodybuilder. And then scaling that back a little bit, the people that I am interested in helping the most. And so think about this. I'm like, this is my wife and I, so we want to look fit, even though we're getting older, we want to, yes, we, we lift weights, but we want to look like we, we lift weights. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm asking that question also directly because the tendency, I think, in the general population is 
that um, that when they pick up information or they go about this path is they start opening up things like fitness magazines and bodybuilding magazines and start looking at the training programs and the diets that you see these elite lifters lifting and try to mimic those things right away. And I think that I would imagine that there's a difference for why certain things work with that population and why you don't need those things. Um, and obviously with regard to training volume and so forth, but I would imagine there's some particular things that are different in the diet as well. And you mentioned yeah, protein. You, you make a great point looking at you know, magazines or I guess even now more websites and looking at what people say they do with their training or people, what they say they do with their nutrition, I'm sure you can appreciate, it has to be sexy to sell. You're not going to click on the website. You're not going to buy the magazine if it's not just a little bit more extreme. And so I, I, one, I don't believe a lot of what I'm seeing in the mass media. And then the second thing is the, the reality, it's pretty boring, repetitive behaviors that allow somebody to have a more muscular physique and to be uh, to, to live their life with a little bit less less body fat than than let's say neighbors, friends, or colleagues who aren't quite as serious about what they do. So there's no secrets. It's just a matter of consistency, discipline, and maybe some targeted supplementation as well. And you got to do the right things, and that's what we're going to dive into. And that that's the thing is that like. What I notice is, is that, uh, right, everything that's sexy, that sells that, you know, people like lots of variations of exercises, lots of different, most of the people that are successful within the field of bodybuilding and fitness competition, just do these mundane ritual things over and over again. And I think that one thing I'm, and I'm way ahead of this, but one of the things that has always bothered me about the whole concept of difficulty with most of our population dealing with inability to lose body fat is why the field tends to go so far into this direction of like um, certain things. When we look at a field like bodybuilding, which has been around forever, let's say even just as far back only as the, the 50s and 60s, and they do these ritualistic things, they, they never fail to get somebody to look lean and muscular on stage. But yet we're not seeing with the recommendations that bodybuilders use that consistently get that same outcome and applying those principles somewhere else. They're almost like two completely different fields. And nobody has seemed to kind of been like, wait a minute, what are we doing here? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So like, you know, you want to get people lean. If you're a weight loss expert or a medical doctor that has to deal with these things, you should kind of at least be knowledgeable of, of what consistently works and gets people actually lean. And so, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Now, and uh, the approach that I take is to make this, and this, I this is also what sets me apart. I, the things that I advocate for and the evidence that I draw my opinions from are to help people to do this within a maintainable lifestyle. So I'm not asking people to go to extreme measures. Now they, obviously, as we both know, the, there are aspects of the fitness population that will do that. But if you can't make these things maintainable for you, and that will be different from person to person, I'm not helping anybody. Yeah. I mean, they got to be able to stick with it in the long run, right? And that's a whole nother animal. Yep. So let's talk about these. I don't want to talk, get our uh, talk into two major categories, which obviously, because we're talking about body comp here, we want to separate this into gaining muscle uh, topics, but also we'll talk about uh, losing body fat. So first and foremost, let's talk about muscle. Okay. Okay. Um, so number one, we are talking about, we have a number of things to discuss here, which is gaining lean body mass, um, gaining muscle tissue. Now, can you talk about uh, the distinction between uh, like dry tissue and, you know, general lean tissue in terms of when you're doing body comp measurements, there is a difference between these kind of two different things, right? Yeah. And to me, it gets a little bit laborious and I, um, so I use the word muscle mass, but that's a very general term and it's not scientifically correct. But for me, I'm trying to communicate to people who aren't scientists a lot of times. So I just use the word muscle mass, but I will explain technically your body at its most basic level for body composition has two compartments, fat mass, and then everything else. And we would call that fat free mass. So fat-free mass, a lot of people just assume, oh, that's the muscle. Well, yes, and bones and organs and body water 
and connective tissue. So then, so fat-free mass is kind of, again, it's everything but, but the fat in the body. And then you have things like um, lean body mass, which that would, um, that tends to be some, we also have fat in our skeletal muscle. We have soft tissue lean mass. Uh, what else? We have dry fat-free mass. So it can go on and on and on in every single um, element or every single different iteration or definition implies a different component. So I, I appreciate the fact when I say muscle mass, if somebody were to gain 10 pounds of body weight, and let's say they gain no fat, did they gain 10 pounds of muscle? No, they have some additional body water now since they have a larger body. Um, bone mineral density might be a little bit higher. Connective tissue is now greater. But the most of that body weight gain is going to be muscle. We don't expect your heart to get much bigger. I don't think your kidneys are getting much larger. So um, scientists are going to be very specific in their terminology. I think for 99% of the population, we can just assume if I, if, if I gain weight and I didn't gain body fat, I gain muscle. If I lost weight, I've lost muscle again, if I didn't lose body fat, or if I, um, if I gain gain, you know, it's, I, I don't like always defining that term. I want to be general. Cause I think most people can appreciate the, the major application of that term. Yeah. And in particular, when we start getting into the different types of body composition measurement styles, but also these fluctuations in weight throughout the day too, is to help people understand, you know, that that is all one big clump of measurement you have. It's either fat or it's all these other things. And if things are fluctuating on the day, I mean, can you lose, uh, even if the, if the, the body fat test shows that your fat is, the, is stable and your weight is going up and down, are you gaining and losing muscle? I mean, well, there's other components in here. There's water and there's other stuff that's going on here. And you think that con that concept is a little confusing for some people. I mean, but there's the key point take home I see there is there's a lot of other stuff to look at, right? Yes. And you make a great point with water. Water is the biggest variable that's going to change from day to day, from hour to hour. Um, that's why I tell people don't, don't do a body composition assessment more like I'd say every four weeks would be about the, the least amount of time that I would recommend because if you do it every single day and you get, you know, a pound of muscle today and then you're lost two pounds, you didn't really gain a pound of muscle from yesterday, nor did you lose a pound of muscle, but your body water changes, which makes it look like you've gained muscle or lost fat. The person testing you, depending on what device they're using, they could, they're not a perfect tester. So their technique could be different from one day to the other. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a, and if you're going to do more frequent, like sometimes we have these bathroom scales that will estimate your body fat percentage. If you're going to do that, always take a weekly average and that will tend to smooth out these day-to-day -day changes because you'll go crazy if you if you think that what the scale says today is reflective of actual body changes, there's a lot of variation. And we also rule thing, out, go ahead. Oh, one other thing I wanted to say is if you have, I don't, whatever you use in terms of your body fat assessment, what, you know, if you're going to use skin folds, bod pod decks or whatever, and regardless what you use or how often you do it, just always make sure that you are using standardized conditions. And to me, the easiest thing to do is the first thing in the morning after you go to the bathroom, that's the time that you should do your scale weight, a body composition test. That way you don't have food in your system. That's the variable that you can eliminate. You've just urinated. So you don't have to worry about that body water that's in your body. Um, and you know, you're rested. So it's not like you've been, you know, just coming from a workout. So if you can just have a standardized testing, again, the matter regardless of how you're getting it tested and regardless of how often that will make it a lot more consistent, just having a standardized testing environment. Yeah. And that's all a good pre setup for, and why I wanted to, to bring this stuff up too. And the body companies is trying to accurate as these questions start to come in, in terms of like, how much muscle can you gain? How much fat you can lose? Some of these things, we start to get these bizarre bloated numbers from social media and Instagram of these certain things. 
Like for example, somebody telling me they've got an athlete that they can put 10 pounds of muscle on in like three, four weeks. And you're like, you realize that that's not really even possible. So I don't discount that somebody could put 10 pounds on, but it's certainly not going to be lean muscle tissue. There's water in there. There's all sorts of things that's happening. And first of all, you got to get clean measurements. You got to understand that when you're looking at the scale, what the heck it is that you're actually seeing and those things going up and down. So I think that's really critical. People don't understand. And this is a good time to kind of go right into that next question I would have is, so when we're starting to talk about muscle, you know, based on that and measurements and consistency, what is the kind of like average amount or an ideal amount of lean mass that you're going to gain? Now, um, I would qualify this statement is I know that you're working with people that are more on the regular uh, routine fitness-based population, which that number is probably going to be a little different from the beginner. But when you start talking about gaining muscle mass, what kind of numbers are we talking about that are realistic amongst the population? Yeah. And my, my subjects in our research are usually resistance trained. So you're right. They're not often beginners, although we just did a study in um, um, non-trained females. But what we typically see is over an eight week period, anywhere from two to four pounds of fat free mass. Again, I'll call that muscle mass. It's not all, it's not all protein. It's not all muscle but it's gonna be somewhere around two to four pounds on average. And a couple of things to consider about that. That is in my studies, we're giving them optimal protein intake, optimal calories. We are actually required, requiring our subjects to work out in my lab. So they're under the microscope. Every rep, every set is being watched. So they're training as hard as they've ever trained. They're not skipping any workouts. So the, what we see in the research labs, especially for the researchers that do it how I do it, you're getting the top end of gains in muscle mass that are going to be humanly possible because of the consistency, the optimal nutrition, and the seriousness of the training. So when I say two to four pounds, that's an ideal amount in two months. And if our studies kept going on, let's say we did it for four months, does that mean it's going to be four to eight pounds? No, you you have this uh, plateauing effect, which would always happen. And of course, as you already mentioned, if you're a beginner, go ahead and expect to see the best muscle gains from your training in the first year. And then it's pretty depressing how little muscle you keep gaining every year, even though you're doing everything correctly. But even considering, and I, I think somebody else I, uh, for a while had, had brought this point up to me, and like, if you think about gaining anywhere from 10 to 20 pounds of, of muscle onto your frame, that can, can completely change the way that somebody looks. I and mean, it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's, that could significantly make a difference. Yeah, if it's, if it's 10 pounds of fat-free mass or muscle mass, that's, yeah, that's a much different looking person. Um, and I would say 10 pounds, if you can do that in a year, if you can, you're still in the elite category. You're still an outlier, um, for, according to most. And that's over a year to build, to, to gain 10 pounds of muscle. And again, I'm, you won't do that in year two and year three. It's, it's just, it, I, it's, it would be very rare for that to happen. Interesting. So you're going to see this big boost right away. It's going to start to level off again, but still, I mean, for most people, if you think about it under ideal conditions, which we haven't talked about what those conditions are, we're talking about, you could gain 10 pounds of muscle in a year and a half, right? So, I mean, that's a year and a half, almost two years, and that's enough to completely change your physique with, with optimal conditions. Now, do you see a difference between men and women when it comes to the muscle gain under those ideal conditions? Yeah, men will gain more absolute muscle mass. And what I mean by that is, let's just, let me give an example. They're both doing the same training, optimal nutrition. A male may gain 10 pounds in the first year. A female will gain six pounds of muscle in the first year. But as a percentage of an increase from their prior muscle mass, there's no difference. They both gained, let's just say, 10% more muscle over the year, but because the male started with more, he gains an absolute amount of more muscle, but percentage wise, it's the same. So depending on how you, you want to define that, 
or which category or how you want to discuss the outcome. Men gain more absolute, but they do not gain more as a percentage of their previous muscle mass gains. That seems like a significant stat there um, in terms of the percentage of all. So they're, both men and women are capable of gaining at the same basic rate, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Which we used to think testosterone was the driver of this. And women have like what one, like 5% of the amount of, of testosterone um, in their bodies as compared to males. So now what we appreciate is, or the current thinking, it's all about muscle protein synthesis, more about protein intake. And you have to have a base level of testosterone, but testosterone's not necessarily drive this. Now that's not to say that if you injected somebody with a lot of testosterone. And we're not talking about that. That would be a super physiological amount of testosterone. I wouldn't argue that that would change things drastically. Gotcha. Now, so let's talk about another piece here is that as they're gaining that certain amount, uh, is there a certain amount of body fat that you find that is inevitable with those gains? So that's kind of pushing it, right? You're saying two to four pounds and is that while trying to keep body fat in the ideal range, is that allowing people to gain body fat? What is actually the, the, the quota for that? The, I, I believe the ideal conditions to gain additional muscle is to be in a caloric surplus. So you're eating more calories than what your body needs. That puts your body in an anabolic state. And in that case, you should expect to gain some additional body fat. But if you didn't, if you were strategic in your nutritional approach and you did certain strategies like, yes, you increase calories, but all from protein, you can really target weight gain all coming from muscle mass, fat-free mass, and really keep additional body fat levels low. So it's, it, it is not a necessity, but it is typical as you gain muscle you will gain some body fat. Okay. And so let's jump right into that. So we know that we've got two figures to chat here is in terms of calories, right? And then the protein. Now I'm really curious. So you've got to increase calories above the baseline. How are you figuring out the caloric intake that's optimal for muscle mass gain for the individual? Yeah. So let me do, let me make one statement or caveat statement to that. You don't have to increase calories to gain muscle mass. It, it just makes it a more of an ideal or optimal environment to gain more muscle. But many people, if they just keep their calories the same and they're consistent with resistance training, they'll gain muscle without gaining extra body fat. And, and again, they can do that without additional calories. It's just not as optimal to do that if your goal is to gain muscle. And that's one of my philosophies is really embrace the phase that you want to, the phase that you're in or the goal that you want to achieve. If you want to gain muscle, go after that. If you want to lose body fat, go after that. There, there are two different uh, strategies that I would advise people take depending on their goal. Um, did I, what was your, what was the, Question. So that was a really good oh, point. How so, much should they so increase? So we're talking about maintenance and maintenance is good and we can gain muscle, but then there are ideal conditions. So what is the ideal condition? I personally like the condition of trying to increase muscle mass with as little fat mass as possible. So we have to appreciate that my approach is going to be conservative because I know how hard it is to lose body fat once you have it. And that can also cause some other issues, some health issues as well. So I typically recommend about a 10, five to 10% above maintenance calories in a muscle building phase. Now, if you go to 15 or 20%, you may gain a little more, more muscle, but as we've been discussing, you're going to have to anticipate that you're going to have additional body fat with that as well. But a, a good general number is about a 10%. So if, if my typical calories are 2000 go if you go to 2200 calories per day that that's you're putting your body in a favorable environment to gain muscle so that's not a significant amount this isn't the old uh eat until you're bloated and just keep packing it in the bulking phase in order you don't <laughs> need that much so you're saying that in in natural lifters you know who aren't taking super physiological levels of testosterone and so forth we only need 5 to 10%. We even need less than that. We can gain muscle on that, 
But to create these ideal conditions without gaining too much body fat, we can only go five to 10% above and we're good to go. We're going to get optimal results from that. Yeah. And um, again, my approach is helping people to do this within a, within a maintainable lifestyle and one in which they're not packing on a lot of additional body fat. Gotcha. And then, okay. So then within that, let's talk about those macronutrients, carb, protein, and fat. So the, the key piece that seems to be important for you is, is the uh, protein intake, right? So, so what are we doing with protein intake to create ideal circumstances? So the first thing that I would encourage somebody to do, if they're, if they're trying to gain muscle mass, I would say, let's increase your calories, but initially let's just increase protein. Let's not do anything, you know, keep your carbs and fat where they're at. And if you are resistance training, I'm not aware of any research that would suggest or that has reported that you actually gain body fat under those situations. It's kind of crazy because, you, you know, we're all taught, as was I, if you increase your calories, you're going to gain you're going to gain body fat. Well, that's that's may not be true if and again, this only applies to people who are resistance training. So increase protein. Now, maybe protein's already very high. And in that case, increasing it more may not add much of a benefit. So in that case, let's go ahead and add in carbs and fat. But initially for a, for most people, increasing the majority of the initial calories from protein makes sense. Okay. Do you have a grammage number that's ideal for that? I, I, I like to base it on relative to body weight. So yeah, I, I give a range of a goal. So um, I'm going to use grams per pound. Is that, that probably is your audience more. Yeah. Sometimes it's science is always grams per kg. Um, but in this country, <laughs> nobody, everybody's always having to get out their calculators. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, 0.75 grams per pound up to a gram per pound. Now a gram per pound, one gram of protein per pound of body weight is a lot of protein for most people. Bodybuilders do it pretty easily. Everybody else, that's a pretty big goal. Now, do you have to get that high? No, but 0.75 grams per pound. So for me, if I'm 200 pounds, that would be 150 grams per day. That's the amount that you're going to get. the. If you can reach that, you're getting most of the benefit from a high protein diet. If you go from, one, uh, if you go from 0.75 to 1, I believe that you, you do get an additional benefit, but the higher and higher you go, the less and less of the benefit you're going to reap from that increased protein. Gotcha. And if you're going to go above the maintenance, right, and you're going to keep going, and if you, you're going to continue increasing, so obviously the first goal to hit would be the one gram per pound, right? But would you continue to go higher that in order to prevent fat gain over maintenance calories? Um. I, I, if you go above a gram per pound, and some people do, I think that your the benefit is less and less. And if somebody can do it easily, I would say, okay, let's do this. Um, it's going to make you feel fuller. Um, it's not going to, obviously, it's going to help maintain and grow muscle more than less. But if somebody's really struggling to even get 0.75 grams per pound, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell them, oh, you have to get a gram and then we have to go higher. That's not making it maintainable for them in their lifestyle. And the reality is they're getting 90, maybe 95% of the anabolic or muscle building benefit, even from that amount of protein. Interesting. Now, and one of those additional things that you had talked about, which it's kind of like in my mind gets triggered as I got to follow up as a, a potentially controversial statement is that you can go over maintenance calories and not gain body fat. What's going on there? How do you eat more and not put fat on? Yeah. So I don't know what's going on there because it's a shock to me, but I'm aware of approximately three or four studies that have all reported the same thing. One of them was in my lab. So I'll, I'll just talk about it. We had resistance trained females um, consume 2.5 grams of protein. And they started at 1.5. I'm sorry, let me give this in pounds. So um, 1.1 grams of protein per pound of body weight. So we had them increase it to that. So there they are. They're above a gram per pound. They started at about 0.7 grams of protein per pound of body weight. And they increased it to that pretty high level. 
And when they did that, their calories actually increased by almost 300 calories per day during these eight weeks. And again, they lifted in my lab. So we, very intense training. And what happened was they lost a significant amount of body fat compared to their baseline levels. That's, that was in spite of increasing their calories. But what are the two things that happened? It was the increase in calories was all from protein. So they didn't increase carbs or fat and they were resistance training. And I would also add, I'm aware of some other studies where the same thing happened. They increased all additional calories above maintenance in the form of protein and the subjects, males and females, either didn't gain body fat or in one of the other studies, they actually lost body fat like what we had in my lab. And by the way, this data is published um, this was a 2018 study, so it's um, it's it's publicly available. Wow, that is interesting, and and this is something, and we're not going to have time to talk about it today. But I wanted to to dive into, and, and a key point for those listening, that the level of resistance training was no joke. I mean, I'm sure you're pushing the, these people in terms of the training. They're not in there lollygagging, uh, hanging out on the machines, right? I mean, you're you're pushing them pretty hard. Yeah. And that's an important component here. Everything that we're talking about, about muscle gain is contingent on the body receiving an anabolic stimulus to grow the muscle. And that anabolic stimulus is resistance exercise. You're, you're, you're not going to gain muscle without an anabolic stimulus, such as resistance exercise to the body. Uh, now, sedentary people who start running, they'll gain a little bit of muscle mass. Even aerobic exercise does gain muscle in previously sedentary people, but we're talking a pound or two at most. And what we're resistance training again, uh, two pounds, three pounds, four pounds over a relatively short period of time. So it's really this synergism between the stimulus of the resistance exercise and then this protein nutrient that we keep talking about, protein allows the body to adapt to that stimulus. So they work together. The resistance training stimulates muscle growth. The elevated protein intake allows the body to adapt to that stimulus and actually puts on additional muscle mass. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's make a, tr a transition here between this and our next topic, because you already brought it up which was the uh, gaining muscle and losing body fat at the same sort of thing. So we talked about, so there's almost, it sounds like a sliding scale, right? If you want to optimize muscle mass, you need to be kind of on the higher end of uh, the caloric intake maintenance or slightly above, and you, you should focus on it if you want to get the best benefits. You can gain muscle at the same time uh, while you're at basically maintenance calories, right? It's not as good as going a little bit higher now let's talk about the fat loss component here and how this works. Now, I would imagine it's the same, right? If you're going to try and lose body fat, you should focus on fat loss, but it doesn't work the same way. So in the middle ground, we can do both, you know, but then on those two ends, right? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll phrase this as a question. Can you build muscle and lose fat at the same time? The answer is yes. Plenty of research to to demonstrate this. In fact, I, the study I just told you about that happened in those resistance trained females. Yes, it happens. Should, is it the expectation? No, I would say it's the exception, but it can happen. We've got, I can, you know, show you 10 or 20 studies um, with reason. Again, this only happens with resistance training studies generally, but at maintenance calories, somebody starts resistance training, gain muscle, lose fat. Even some people that are in a caloric deficit, they reduce their calories. It's possible that they do gain muscle and lose body fat. Again, it's, it, it, I, I always like to say is that you shouldn't expect that to happen, but it can happen. So like you just said, if you want to lose body fat, put your body in an environment where that's more likely to happen, where you target fat loss. Okay. So let's talk about that environment, right? So optimizing fat loss. So there's a point where we've got maintenance. There's only so many calories or, and, and protein. We're going to really benefit maximally here. Now, when we start to go downward, we're going to have to be at a caloric deficit, right? To maximize fat. How are you determining what the needs are to maximize the fat loss component? 
So what we do or what we've done in most of my research studies is we will place our subjects in a 25% caloric deficit. So if they're eating 2000 calories and they're maintaining their weight there, we'll drop them to 1500 calories per day. Now, as you can probably predict, we try not to drop protein. We, we kind of have a floor of protein where we don't want them to go below 0.75 grams per pound. And in fact, most of my weight loss studies are 0.9 grams per pound, one gram per pound. We keep protein pretty high. Why? That, I'm sorry. Uh, was... uh, yeah, three things. <clears throat> All synergistically working together. One, the reason that people fail on diets is because they lose the battle of, to hunger. Hunger always wins. You can beat hunger today. I can beat hunger for a meal. Hunger will always win over the course of a few weeks, a few months. So protein is the most satiating nutrient. So if you have a higher protein intake when dieting, it helps you feel the fullest and helps you helps prevent hunger the most. Now, I'm not saying you won't be hungry. I'm just saying you're, that's the nutrient that helps you the most. Second thing, higher protein diets when dieting, help preserve muscle mass to the, to the greatest extent. And then lastly, if you can preserve muscle mass, you're also keeping your metabolism, your resting energy expenditure from lowering. And when most people diet, if they don't care about um, maintaining their muscle, their resting metabolic rates go down. And that, that has two problems. One, it's almost guaranteed that when their diet's over, they're gonna gain body weight back. And unfortunately, a lot of that weight gain back is body fat. Oh, we call it, we call that fat overshoot. The other thing that happens is it's just harder and harder to lose body weight and body fat when your metabolism goes down. Because what used to be a 500 calorie deficit may only be a 200 calorie deficit now because your metabolism has slowed down. Gotcha. And so I want to add one additional piece here is because we're going to get start talking about that metabolic component. Number one is just a, a real quick question I have for you. Do you ever have anybody in your studies that you have seen that when you reduce their calories and you do the protocols, they fail to lose body fat? It's, 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 it has happened, uh, but it's rare. It's very rare. Now, um, I'm not dealing with obese individuals. We're dealing with people who don't often have a lot of body fat to lose. Um, but it's, it's rare. Um, less, I'm just trying to think, uh, we, we just, we just got a study accepted. We had uh, about 30 subjects. There may have been one or two. Um, and, and we have nutrition coaches that work with our subjects and they, I mean, they're getting check-ins every week on all of their, I mean, we track every gram of, of food that goes into their body, carbs, protein, and fat. So we have a very good um, idea of, are they really following this or are they not? Um, when they don't lose body fat, we, the, the, uh, it's generally because they're not following the diet, but especially in this more bodybuilding, this elite, um, and even people just in that are serious fitness enthusiasts, I have seen and believe that yes, you can do everything right. And for some reason, your body does not drop body fat. Now, again, is that the expectation? No, it's the exception to what should happen, but it happens that there's too many people that I know or that I believe and trust they're doing everything right and their bodies fail to lose body fat. So then now you've got to try to, I mean, if you're coaching them or you're their health coach, now you're having to try to solve that problem. Yes. And I mean, that's an important question. And that's what I want to throw out there as an expert. Have you seen this happen? Because I don't want to hallucinate. I think it's possible. You have the evidence. You say, I've seen this happen. Right. So that is I have interesting. Seen it happen. And two and, is, go ahead. Uh, I, I would say it's a little more common in people who have a lot of a dieting history. So people like body, like especially female bikini competitors. Um, th there's, and again, I guess now I'm just opining. I'm, I'm, I'm theorizing this repeated dieting, not dieting, dieting, not dieting. I think that tends to put people more likely to have their bodies not respond to a caloric deficit. 
That's interesting. Now, uh, that'll lead into another piece here is, is determining the caloric deficit. Um, I think that the, in what I had looked at, there's multiple ways to do this. I'm curious how you determine that. Are you using a metabolic testing device where you breathe and it determines your resting calor caloric intake? How are you determining what that number is from which you create your deficit? Yeah. So you're, you're very, you're very educated on this. There's two common ways. One is what you said. You measure somebody's resting energy expenditure, and that's just how many calories they burn if they were to lay down on a table for 24 hours. It's, their, it's the amount of calories they're burning to keep their bodies alive. Then you, you have to add to that. Well, how many calories are they burning when they go to work? How many calories are they burning as they cook their dinner? Maybe they work out. Maybe they take the dog out for a walk. So you have to add in some calories to their basal energy expenditure because they're not just laying down. So typically that'll be like a, a, a factor of like 1.3 to 1.6. And that would be their maintenance calories. And then you could subtract calories from that. Uh, that's very common in the research. Um, I don't like that. So what we do in my lab is for our subjects or if I'm working with clients, I have them track everything they're eating for a two week period. And they also have to weigh themselves every day for these two weeks. And I, and the, the rule is don't change anything about what you normally do. If you change something, you're, you are, you're, you're short changing this, this system here. You're, you're not, you're not going to help us get the, your true value. So if somebody's eating what they normally eat for two weeks and they're weighing themselves every day, and we take the average weight and it didn't go up or down over those two weeks, we now have an estimate of their maintenance calories that's not based on a machine and not based on assuming how active they are. It's based on what they actually eat. So I think it's a much more accurate way to do it. Now it is more intensive. It's a greater commitment because they have to track everything they eat for two weeks. They have to weigh themselves every day. But as as a scientist, I want and need and rely on valid data. So I think that data is more valid. It's a little bit less of a guess, but it is more of a commitment. But again, we have a research team that, that helps everybody through this. So that's, that's how we do it. I would imagine that's a little complicated for people that eat out a lot and so forth and have a mixture of things. You know, sometimes they're, they're going to Chipotle or they're going to some miscellaneous restaurant that you know, you don't know everything that's in there and you can't basically rely on what, you know, the, uh, they say on their menu, this has how, how many calories in it. So that's going to be a little more tricky than people that are measuring and, and cook their own meals and so forth. All right. Yes. Yeah. Um, eating out definitely adds a lot of variability, but the best we can do, and here's how I can easily live with this Chipotle. We all know, actually I was at Chipotle today and I got a small serving and I wanted a big serving. So Whoever was giving me my, my Chipotle bowl today, it was lower than usual. It's meager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great, great word. But we all know that I'm going to go in, you know, maybe Friday and that, that person's going to give me more. So it all averages out generally over time. So just in that example, a little less Chipotle today, a little more on Friday. It's going to be somewhere close to the stated value. Um. Sure. So it, it kind of works itself out um, with, with that system. And again, we also have the, the other, there's problems with the other method as well. Like maybe the machine, the humidity is higher on one day and that can make your, your metabolic rate seem a little lower than what it should be. So you have issues no matter what, what system you're going to use. So when we get our average, whatever that is over two weeks, assuming that that's the case, we drop the calories, uh, 25% deficit, and we make sure you get 0.75 grams per pound every day. And that's yeah. going to be great uh, starting point. Yes. Um, so yes. And if, if they can go higher than that, we would suggest go higher than that. And the reason we settled on a 25% caloric deficit, and remember, we're also having them resistance train and we're also giving them a relative, you know, kind of a higher protein diet. What we've seen in my lab and multiple studies that are published, that seems to be a very good sweet spot for losing almost all of their weight from body fat and maintaining all of their muscle mass. If you start to get more aggressive than that, 
especially for an a long, you know, a longer period of time, let's say like four weeks, six weeks. Now you're, yeah, you're losing more fat, but you're also losing more muscle mass and your metabolism is going to go down. And we already talked about all those problems. So 25% keeps muscle mass, keeps resting energy expenditure, and really makes the, um, it gives us what we would call a successful outcome. If you lose you know, a hundred percent of your weight from body fat. That's, that's the ideal that that's success. It, it doesn't get better than, well, it gets better if you gain muscle, but again, we don't anticipate gaining muscle when you're in a caloric deficit, even though it's possible. Now, if I ask you the, the question that on the, on the opposite end of this, in terms of the muscle gain. So when you see the rate of fat loss that occurs in an eight week study, is the expectation that that rate of fat loss continues until you get as lean as you want to get? Is that different from gaining muscle? Yeah. So the, the rate of weight loss or the rate of fat loss, um, that, that, all, that tends to plateau. So you're going to get, you're going to be a little bit better earlier and over time it's going to become less and less and less. So that leaves you with a dilemma. Do we increase calories more that's an option. Uh, some of the newer research, uh, this is my studies just about ready to publish a study. What we investigate is taking a break from the diet. Once you reach a plateau, come out of the deficit for a week, maybe two weeks, reset. Maybe it increase. you know, the idea is if your metabolism slowed down, we can get it back up. And now after that one to two week break from your diet, now when we take a break, they're not just eating all of the food they can. It's still a controlled maintenance caloric intake. And now we say, okay, now let's start the diet again. And there is some research in obese males that have shown literally outstanding results from that. Other research, including research from my lab, would suggest, no, you're not getting a much of a benefit for additional fat loss, but it is a break, one, and it, it, there are some psychological benefits to that approach. Now, are you seeing uh, the rates of fat loss amongst men and women about the same? Do they both have an easy time losing body fat? Yes, generally. Now, um, if, if we're going to say sick, we, we have to be careful of, let's use 10% body fat as a, as a threshold for a moment. Males can not easily, but much more easily get to less than 10% than females. If a female gets to less than 10%, she has to be a lot more extreme in her approach. A longer diet, um, a more severe caloric deficit. And that's simply because females carry significantly more body fat than males. If you look at like a, what we call reference man, reference woman, these are like just average males and females. Your average female, don't think fitness, fitness people are lean, but an average female is about 27% body fat. Your average male is 15% body fat. So college, think of a college age male versus female. Again, they're not lifting weights. They're not eating high protein. So females, they just carry more body fat in their breasts, reproductive organs. So to get them to this very lean levels, it is much more difficult. But what you asked, do they, do they, have to work harder to lose body fat. I, I don't believe so. They just have to work harder to get to the same low levels as males, but the males already started at a lower level. Gotcha. All right. I, I got another one for you here. And I know we're, we're starting to run short on time because I always try to keep these things to about 60 minutes, but I have so many more questions. I could chat with you forever about this. And uh, one of the things is, is because of all your experience in with this, we see still a lot of information out there that starts to kind of address the where people are holding body fat. Now, we know that that's clearly a difference between men and women, but throughout your time and measuring body composition and doing these sorts of things, do you notice any interesting patterns about how people lose body fat, how they distribute it? Is that related to the type of diet, resistance training, their hormone levels? Is there anything interesting that has really come about after all the years of research and looking at this? Um, my observations, and again, I don't, I don't research uh, fat patterning or fat distributions, but my observations have told have that my eyes tell me females tend to carry more body fat in the lower body, um, harder to lose in the lower body than than what males have, and we actually have a 
um, we'll call it a, a theory as to why that is physiologically. We have two types of receptors on fat cells. They're called beta adrenergic receptors and alpha adrenergic receptors. Beta adrenergic receptors, when they're activated, they will cause body fat to, to be released from the fat cell and then ultimately burned. Your adrenergic your alpha adrenergic receptors, we don't, when they're activated, they, they lower or suppress fat loss from fat cells. So the theory is that people who have more fat in harder to lose areas, they actually have a greater density of these alpha adrenergic receptors. And what's sad about that is we have epinephrine and norepinephrine they, they kind of, they, they stimulate both types of receptors. So if you have more of these alpha adrenergic receptors, it's just that the, the, what would normally, if you can stimulate the betas, you'll, you'll lose body fat. But since we have more of these, we'll call them bad ones, um, of these awful alpha receptors, it just causes the, the fat pro the fat breaking down process to shut down. So there's, there's the theory as to why we have harder to lose fat areas than other places on our body. So when those individuals are losing, uh, just continue to lose body fat, do they just start to lose it around the area where those receptors are? So they'll get real lean in the upper body and then the body fat will cling to the hips, for example? Yes. Yeah. If that's where they have more of these alpha adrenergic receptors. Now, it's not to say they won't lose fat there, but- this, like you said, they'll lose fat from everywhere else. And that seems to be the last or hardest place to lose it from. And it's, there's a physiological explanation for that. And I've seen a whole nother field. And this is probably another podcast to chat about is that's probably where some of the supplementation and maybe some tweaking strategies to try to get those receptors to start re responding and letting go of that body fat in that area. Huh? I'm a pretty particular, probably something that's interesting for you is to seeing fitness populations that are really trying to scrape off that last bit of body fat in certain areas, right? Yeah, th there is a dietary supplement called Yohimbine that has some theoretical rationale because what it does, it actually blocks the alpha adrenergic receptor, it blocks these alpha receptors. So if you block it, now when you're in a caloric deficit or you're increasing your epinephrine and norepinephrine levels, they're binding, they're, there's a much greater likelihood that they can bind to these beta receptors, which would cause fat loss. But yohimbine, kind of like caffeine, but the, the side effects or, and the adverse events are just a, a, a little bit higher than for caffeine. So it's not for everyone, but again, and I love the science of supplementation and it's really cool how that particular uh, supplement, it actually comes, it's an extract from, uh, from the bark of a uh, yohimbi tree. Man, that's cool stuff. I mean, I think, you know, at this, there's in, in particular, you get to see it where people are, are not necessarily needing global dietary approaches and, and the right training, but you're now getting them to the point where probably at that you're, you're able to notice it more in terms of the effectiveness, because you're working with a population that you're going to see that kind of result with them. Cause it's that last half a percent or 1% thing that they need in order to get to access that body fat. So um, I would I would absolutely love to have you back here. There's a whole slew of questions that I didn't even get to, um, but I want to be appreciative of your time for coming on here. So where can we take a look at, find research, new things that you're up to? Do you have a website, social media, anywhere where we can check out your stuff? Yeah, currently I'm, I have one social media platform that's Instagram and you can find me there at Bill Campbell, PhD. Uh, no website yet, but that's, um, I think we're about two months away from that. So perfect. Yeah. But I'm very active on Instagram. So um, at Bill Campbell, PhD, everybody will link to all of those links or anything that's upcoming down here in the uh, podcast notes. Uh, and Bill, I want to thank you again so much for taking the time here and sharing with us all this stuff. And uh, I, I very much appreciate you. I want to have you back sometime in the future to discuss my additional questions. <laughs> yes. I would love to love to come back and thank you for the invitation. Awesome. Thank you. All right, everybody.